Aloha. Uh, welcome to Island Connections. Uh, I'm Brahim Aude, your host for this evening. And the topic for today is uh, 911 Islands in Crisis. And uh, we're live on the air, so uh, we'd love uh, to hear from you. And the number to call on Oahu is 956-5670. And on the neighbor islands is 1-800-342-7949. So please uh, send us your, uh, you know, talk to us, uh, questions, comments, uh, we welcome those. And uh, we uh, have uh, three um, guests uh, toni uh, tonight to talk about uh, this uh, Islands in Crisis uh, topic. And uh, first is uh, Kyle Kajihiro. He's uh, the program director of American Friends uh, Service Committee of Hawaii. Welcome. Uh -huh. And uh, Miriam Sharma, she's professor of Asian Studies at UH Manoa. And uh, John Okamura, he's assistant professor of Ethnic Studies. So welcome to you all. And, um, you know, maybe we'll start uh, with you, uh, Mimi, because uh, you were in New York also uh, just uh, a few days back you returned. So could you just tell us uh, something about your impressions since uh, the events of uh, September 11th? Uh, right. Well, it was really interesting because um, New York is also home to me, my uh, original home before my real home, which is now Hawaii. So I did go back to visit family as well as to attend a uh, Pacific Island Studies Conference. And the thing that was uh, so interesting there is how the personal and the political get mixed up because, for example, just to share a little bit, um, I have a very a dear sister who I'm close with and we've never seen eye to eye on a number of things politically. Mm -hmm. um, and this time it was more difficult because these were not abstract ideas. They were personal things that uh, were affected. My nephew was affected. He was in the area. Uh, his business, he actually not only was in the area exactly at that time, but he saw those horrible uh, bodies that were jumping out of the uh, Twin Towers. After that trauma, uh, his business closed down because he had had a successful business, a uh, bar restaurant, and it has just closed down. It was right at the perimeter. Um, so what I found difficult is when I try to abstractly talk about uh, positions um, to people like my sister in New York who felt it very personally, um, it, it was very hard to press uh, opposing more critical views of U.S. foreign policy, of, um, you know, what role our government has played in all of this. And um, just as uh, we, we will, I think other people can comment, it's very hard to uh, be strong and continue to oppose the military here in Hawaii because all of this opposition and critique as excellent as it uh, may be, is misinterpreted, I feel, by many as being unpatriotic mm. and, and suspect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, <coughs> New York is, I mean, otherwise New York is New York, and uh, the people bounce back. Of course, there's a terrible plane crash today, and even if it has nothing to do with um, yeah, that terrorism. Was yesterday was. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yeah. yesterday. Right. Um, you know, it's something that it's like one more yeah. blow mm -hmm. to New Yorkers who uh, proverbially are resilient, yeah. but we see how much they can yeah. uh, get back. Yeah. Kyle, uh, other impressions you have? Um, uh, first impressions on uh, the impacts on Hawaii, on, on uh, the nation, actually? Sure. Um, well, as, uh, as some of you may know, the American Friends Service Committee is a Quaker organization, mm -hmm. so it's a pacifist organization. And we've been active in um, mobilizing a peace response mm -hmm. uh, to the September 11 uh, attacks. And um, what we've noticed here in Hawaii is just this incredible um, increase in, in militarization, mm -hmm. uh, not only in the actual hardware and troop movements, <clears throat> but also in the in the sort of thinking and uh, the, the, the sentiment that's that's coming up in people. Um, and uh, it's. You know, it's made it very difficult um, for issues like Makua Valley, which mm -hmm. we've been supporting the community there that's been calling for uh, peace for Makua. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the group had, groups had been making um, headway over the years. Um, when September 11 happened, all of a sudden it was like the ground shifted. Mm -hmm. And uh, people who had been supporting the movement 
were now somewhat ambivalent. They still felt, you know, bad about uh, military destruction of the land, mm -hmm. uh, the conflict uh, between sort of uh, this military culture and uh, the Hawaiian culture, which is to take care of the land, and this sort of overwhelming feeling that, um, you know, uh, vulnerability, of fear, and that something needed to be done, and you know, we need to suspend all of our critical judgment yeah. about the military. So it, it made it, it. It's been, um, you know, very tricky. Mm -hmm. Uh, sort of mobilizing a critical um, response. Response to that, yeah. yeah. Um, and John, uh, do you have uh, any first impressions uh, on impacts, uh, especially on Hawaii and the nation? Well, one of the things that uh, <coughs> I've been struck by are, are the parallels between um, what has been going on since September 11th and uh, 10 years ago mm -hmm. during the Gulf War. Uh, so first kinds of things the students were telling me about where they're being laid off from work because they had part-time jobs in Waikiki. And of course, 10 years ago, that led us into a recession for much of the 90s. And we were just coming out of that um, uh, towards the late 90s and then year 2000. The university ended the seven straight years of budget cuts. Now, I'm concerned if we're headed towards another decade of recession and possibly again, seven straight years of budget cuts, what's going to be the impact here? Are we going to see uh, another massive uh, tuition increases, which had a uh, tremendous impact, negative impact, on uh, minority enrollment at the university. Um, since we work here at the university, I'm concerned about the impacts here in terms of uh, students being able to finish uh, and, and enter the university and uh, uh, recruitment of more faculty, mm -hmm. because we've got ongoing uh, retirement since the uh, 90s, but I'm not sure if we're necessarily repla replacing them to the yeah. same extent. So what we're basically um, talking about is the uh, impact uh, of September 11th uh, on Hawaii and how deep and broad uh, it, uh, it has been uh, so far and we don't know what the future might bring. Uh, so these are all uh, good topics uh, to discuss and that's what uh, we will be doing now. But uh, also because this is about September 11th, etc., it just so happened that uh, there are three courses uh, on campus that will be offered uh, next semester uh, on uh, you know the Middle East and on Islam and there's uh, a couple of other courses that uh, Mimi will be uh, teaching uh, next semester so I just want to show one of the courses uh, in fact uh, in ethnic studies since I am an ethnic studies uh, I'll show it first <laughs> and uh, it is uh, called uh, uh, this is the uh, the one here on the Elmo uh, okay, here, Department of Ethnic Studies, Spring 2002, A Course in the Middle East, ES455B, and it's Comparative Ethnic Conflict. And it's uh, Tuesdays, 12 to 2.30, and uh, I'll be teaching that. And uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, a course, uh, it just so happened that, uh, you know, we had it planned before September 11th, and it just so happened mm -hmm. that... Uh, it, uh, it's all the more relevant at mm -hmm. this point. And, uh, you know, uh, community people are welcome to enroll. Uh, also faculty, staff, students, anyone is welcome to enroll in this one. And uh, there's also a couple of other courses. One is uh, in history, History 355, uh, the modern uh, Middle East. Uh, and this is uh, taught by Elton Daniel. Uh, and he's a real scholar of uh, Middle East uh, studies. And also there's another course, I don't know the number of that, but it's an introduction to Islamic philosophy and by, uh, will be taught by Tamara Albertini, who is re really an expert on Islam. And um, there's a couple of uh, other courses, Mimi, uh, that you'll be teaching, and you have sections of yes, that. Yes, uh, uh, yeah. one of them is a 400 level class that's in Asian studies and cross-listed with Im women's studies. Mm -hmm. It's called Gender Issues in Contemporary Asia, and I will have a big section uh, dealing with uh, women and Islam. Mm -hmm. And my other course is a uh, course on India, and there I will have, again, although it's a general introduction to contemporary India, I will have a section on the current uh, politics uh, of the whole crisis yeah. because, of course, it uh, involves India and Pakistan greatly. Yeah. So, uh, actually, uh, uh, one of the important things also in terms of uh, the impacts is the question of, uh, you know, uh, academic freedom, uh, civil liberties, uh, including freedom of speech, uh, and all those kinds of stuff. So. We have, in fact, uh, a tape uh, that we want to show about uh, uh, Channel 2, Joe Moore uh, saying something about the um, uh, 
press conference that professors of post-war have done, and then uh, right after that, there's a, a segment from uh, the uh, press conference itself. So we'll watch this, and then we can comment on this, and we'll continue from there. All right, let's go. Professors on the University of Hawaii campus who have spoken out against America's war on terrorism have reported receiving hate mail. Last week, Halnani K. Tras criticized the U.S. during a university forum against the war efforts, saying the U.S. foreign policy was to blame for the September 11th attacks and that the U.S. does not stand for freedom or democracy. Now, she and others involved in a professor's opposed to war group have reported receiving hate mail and death threats. Some of these hate emails and at least one phone call do more than hate. They actually threaten physical injury. Trask says she is concerned about public officials' reaction to her comments. She said she hopes the governor, who called her comments idiotic, and others will meet with her to discuss their opposing views. The UH president also said he did not agree with Trask's comments, but upheld her right to make them. On October 17th, the University Peace Initiative asked Professor Hanani K. Trask and Professor Susan Hippensteel to give a public talk. Their topic was to offer an analysis of possible root causes of the terrible loss of life on September the 11th. Channel 2 News that same evening gave an incorrect and highly prejudiced report of Professor Trask's talk. In the same report, Channel 2 News also interviewed Governor Cayetano and President Dobell for their reaction to remarks that Channel 2 News said Professor Trask had made. Now one problem with this so-called journalism is that Channel 2 News asked for reactions from two public officials who attract television viewers but who did not actually listen to Professor Trask's talk. Since late night Thursday, October 18th, both Professors Trask and Hippensteel have been receiving hate email and hate phone calls. Some of these hate emails and at least one phone call do more than hate. They actually threaten physical injury. Professor Trask, of course, has also received hate phone calls and scores of hate email. None of these emails or phone calls even try to talk about substantive issues or ideas of these academic professionals. Instead, the messages all use extremely violent language to attack them, not only for their political views, but because they are women or because of their ethnic or racial identity. A police report has been filed, and to its credit, the UH administration has assured UPI POW that it sees this as an issue of academic freedom, that it stands behind the necessary academic principle that all faculty and students have the right to express their opinions without fear of reprisal. There was one uh, very explicit um, death threat phoned in uh, to Professor Hippensteel. Uh, I have also read emails in which uh, physical uh, injury or uh, death threats were implied. Well, these are uh, serious things, yeah. I mean, uh, regarding uh, civil liberties and freedom of speech, etc. So, any comments, John, on that? Uh? Well, it seems to me they've become the surrogates for the Arabs and Muslims that uh, are not a large community in Hawaii who have also been receiving these hate mail messages, being uh, uh, beaten, harassed, and even killed. Uh, it seems like they've uh, emerged as the targets for the, this, this kind of racial scapegoating in Hawaii because of uh, the absence of large populations of Muslims or Arabs that on the continent are the ones that are uh, receiving the brunt of this kind of yeah. violence. Even like uh, uh, South Asians have been, um, not even Muslims, you know, could oh, be yes, Sikh yeah. or uh, whatever, and they've been like uh, the 
brunt of uh, you know these kinds of hate uh, crimes. Uh, some some mm -hmm. were killed also. Yeah. Oh yeah. So it's uh, it's really tragic that you know uh, we say that we want to defend uh, freedom here from Osama bin Laden and uh, the rest of them guys, uh, but then what we are sacrificing in this is uh, the freedoms that we so cherish, which is uh, especially the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Constitution. Anything on that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, this shows in a more public uh, forum. What I was trying to say earlier, that it becomes very hard to oppose, whether on a personal level or in your professional sphere, and especially for us in the academic sphere, uh, to voice differing views. Um, if you want to present a critical or an opposing view, then somehow you're, I don't know what Cayetano said, you're stupid or uh, you're unpatriotic or you're suspect or they can call you worse names. Uh, the thing that gets me is uh, the fact that people who try, as I was not at the um, professors opposed to war meeting, although I'm a member of the group, I, I was away, but it seems to me that when these series of meetings, what they try to do is present different views, and not only different views, but alternative views to what we are being bombarded literally with every day in the mainstream media, which is one solid view. So now we're trying to have five minutes of airtime for the other view, and even that is being uh, questioned and, and attempted uh, to stifle it. And it seems that the most important uh, aspect of these critical views, which is anathema to uh, people out there, is this um, attempt to present a history to the facts of uh, 911 that they didn't just emerge out of nowhere, that they're not just a result of a clash of civilizations or uh, you know, an attempt to get to the roots of Muslim rage or um, you know, have to do with uh, things that have nothing to do with history yeah. and with America's role, since it's, it's a hegemonic power, with its role in yeah. history. Let's, uh, so. let's uh, do the tape. Uh, there's another segment from Haunani and uh, saying what she said at that uh, okay. forum. And then we can go to Kyle. Let's go. The United States, through its foreign policy in the entire 20th century, has created the conditions that are known as blowback. And I said this at the forum, which was not reported, that there are books, entire scholarly works, written by people who used to be operatives in the CIA for the American government, who have gone through all of the foreign policy decisions of the United States in the 20th century and concluded what I concluded at my talk, which is that the United States bears responsibility for alienating people in the third and fourth worlds, for creating conditions without any democratic participation or discussion that lead people to terrible desperation. It's interesting. Uh, the, uh, that's not what, uh, you know, I heard uh, Joe Moore uh, what people said that Joe Moore reported initially on the forum. I haven't heard uh, Joe Moore himself. Uh, anybody heard uh, Joe? Did no, you? I did, did you hear? hear it. Uh, but uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. Even uh, Powell, uh, you know, uh, Colin Powell said something similar mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, President Musharraf of Pakistan said even more serious stuff than this. You know, so nobody went and said, uh, General Musharraf, we want to bomb the hell out of you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so. Uh, here we go. Uh, you want to? Well, I just, um, I think, uh, you know, Hawaii often sort of masks racial strife and conflict with this idea that this is a racial paradise. And it just shows, this, this whole incident just shows how shallow, you know, beneath the surface it is. You just scratch it a little bit mm -hmm. and this kind of ugliness comes out. And, um, and you know, so we really need to take that seriously, mm -hmm. um, yes. policy makers especially, and, and how they contribute to that kind of discourse. Um, you know, this compulsory patriotism is really disturbing mm -hmm. to me because it, it just, you know, it, it eliminates any intelligent discussion and debate about these issues. Um, and I thought what, what um, Haunani raised were, was good analysis, you know, and it's, and it's stuff that um, 
I, I've seen an, in the media, but you know, you have to ask, well, why was she the lightning rod mm -hmm. uh, for this kind of a backlash? And I, and I think part of that is, is this kind of undercurrent of racism. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, and this is uh, really disconcerting uh, because of uh, you know who Hamnani is. She's a native Hawaiian, mm -hmm. and she has uh, she, she's been outspoken on the mm -hmm. native Hawaiian issue, and uh, some people took it took advantage of what she mm -hmm. said and there's not, uh, these are not her ideas it seems to me because you know at, as she said there have been books written on this and even Colin Powell said that and you know other people have uh, yeah. said similar things you know so um, I don't know I mean anybody else has uh, more stuff uh, to raise on this issue as do I if I, 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 I don't think uh, when um, it was first broadcast on Joe Moore's news program it was a, a tape of her speaking, mm -hmm. yeah. it was what she was alleged to have said, and yeah. then it just got more and more distorted. I think as it went on, mm -hmm. with uh, Cayetano not having heard her speak, just based on what Joe Moore said she had said, uh, you know, it's to me is uh, irresponsible journalism. Yeah, it's it's interesting that uh, you know somebody would comment on something that they haven't seen. Um, I was uh, at the uh, press conference because we were taping uh, segments for here. And uh, somebody asked her, one of the journalists, uh, news media people asked her uh, about Joe, to comment on Joe Moore's initial report. She said, I, I cannot because I haven't seen it, mm -hmm. you see. So, mm -hmm. so that's interesting. <laughs> but, but we also know it's not unusual for people to ban or even burn books that they have not read. Yeah. So <laughs> I think uh, the irresponsibility of, of our uh, people here seems to be in line with the general responsibility of some others. Yeah. Uh, another thing, like uh, I was reading on the email, I don't know if any uh, one of uh, you also read that, uh, an email uh, stating that uh, Alan Dershowitz, who's, uh, you know, prominent lawyer uh, mm. in uh, on the continent Harvard. anyway Harvard yeah, yeah. Harvard law school um, and he was uh, arguing uh, about uh, how justice can be uh, you know uh, brought to bear on the uh, quote unquote perpetrators or suspects or people even who uh, yeah well suspects and uh, how we can use torture perhaps to make sure that uh, they give us the information we need to fight the terrorists. So, I mean, this is uh, uh, what is being created here is a whole uh, environment of, uh, you know, um, one step after another, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, squeezing civil liberties and mm -hmm. freedom of speech, okay. etc., and, you know, creating a climate of fear that reminds you of all kinds of other things in history, including, you know, uh, what happened in Europe and other places, uh, or McCarthyism in this mm -hmm. country in the 50s, and this is really. Uh, Disconcerting to say the least, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, anything, uh, anybody heard uh, about that? Uh, Alan Dershowitz or uh, what he said or something? Well, fortunately, yeah. he's not a government official. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> and he's known for his uh, crazy ideas, too, so maybe he'll just keep it to himself. Yeah. Or that, uh, that's where they're on. But, but it does seem that reactionary uh, forces, both in the islands and uh, in the continental U.S., by trying, for example, to push through. Uh, Congress, the amendment of civil liberties and other acts are really in a way taking advantage of the situation to put into place those uh, obstacles and future barriers to our civil rights that then can be used long after hopefully and mercifully this crisis um, yeah. has been revo resolved. Uh, so you can use it to eavesdrop and detain and, mm -hmm. and, and follow and um, enter without due process mm -hmm. any number of people. Yeah. It's like the racial profiling, mm -hmm. you know, some groups are uh, okay to sacrifice, you know, because, uh, you know, it's in, the, it's in the interest of national security and, uh, you know, damn it, we're in a war. Mm -hmm. And it's like, um, you know, when, this is especially the time when we need to have serious discussion about the consequences of our actions. Yeah. And, and uh, that stuff is just getting tossed out the window. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, Anna, Anna, did you want to say? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, following up on what Carl said, you know, over the weekend the FBI came out with uh, what they called a psychological profile, right, mm -hmm. of the uh, terrorists behind the, uh, the spread of anthrax, mm -hmm. the adult male loner. And this reminds me, maybe it was about a month ago, I, I got, you know, one of these email messages sent that, you know, it was published in a British newspaper, said that based on an interview with a U.S. Justice Department official who remained anonymous, this, they suspected right-wing groups in the U.S. Mm -hmm. were behind the um, anthrax terrorism. And these are the groups behind also the bombing of the 150 abortion clinics uh, mm -hmm. past several years. And of course, the bombing of the federal building in um, Oklahoma City. But it's not a racial profile, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. young yeah. white males. It, mm -hmm. Instead, it's a psychological profile. They even made That's a true. comparison with the Unabomber, who was also a white male. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're not going to profile whites. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. that's the uh, unevenness, the unfairness of profiling that comes yeah. out. Uh, so now, uh, you know, how uh, we, we're talking about all kinds of things, including like uh, the question of uh, how Nani being a native Hawaiian woman and outspoken uh, historically about uh, issues of uh, native Hawaiian. Um, but uh, in terms of the ethnic relations uh, in this uh, in this state, and you know, Kyle, you mentioned something about that. Uh, you know, like scratch the surface, and then you know, all kinds of stuff happen. Uh, you know, that people they're really stereotyping and s some kind of discrimination and all that kind of stuff. But uh, John, you you uh, teach like uh, ethnic identity mm -hmm. courses and you know other kinds of courses relating to ethnic relations. So do you see any kind of shift here or beginning of a shift in terms of ethnic relations in the state? Uh, well, it's because of our dependence or over-dependence on tourism. These yeah. are the people who have lost their jobs, immigrants, especially Filipinos. I imagine some Samoans also. And then there are others who uh, work in uh, industries related to tourism, such mm -hmm. as dri driving taxis, uh, operating small businesses in Waikiki. Uh, the major impact I see is going to be upon them. Mm -hmm. These are the people already we know have been laid off from their jobs and their businesses are also going to suffer. So what we see is a continuation of this widening of the gap between, on the one hand, Chinese, Japanese, Hawaii, Filipinos, Hawaiians, and Samoans. And uh, this widened during the past decade of the recession we had here. And unfortunately, I see it increasing even more so. Mm -hmm. uh, given the uh, downturn in the economy that has just begun and, and it seems to be uh, getting worse with more and more people being laid off from work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kyle, uh, anything? Uh? Well, and this is not based on, on, on any research, but from my own experience and observations, it seemed that World War II was one of these sort of turning points in Hawaii's history where a whole generation of people, you know, Hawaiians, Japanese, whoever, were became Americans overnight. Mm -hmm. And they had to prove you know, their patriotism. And uh, there was a carrot and stick, right? If you weren't a, a patriot, then you were in the camps. If you were, then you get medals. And you, know, you can become a, a politician in, in the state. And, I, and I, I'm you know, sort of wondering if there was also that type of a, a shift that's happening right now with the September 11th. You know, is it forcing people to you know, take sides? Which side are we on? Mm -hmm. And uh, for, especially for. Um, the, the Hawaiian sovereignty movement, you know, it's I think it's it's uh, it's created some confusion and some um, uh, challenges uh, to sort out where are these you know conflicting feelings, where do you place these things, and how do you come through it, mm -hmm. and um, and the media and I think the politicians and the military they they exploit that mm -hmm. fear and confusion and and continue to drive it home that you know if you're not putting a flag on your car, then you know. Sh you know, yeah. you're 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 a traitor. You're you know you're a criminal. You know mm -hmm. you they spit on you, and um, that's you know I, I think it, 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 you look at what happened to Poka Wainui out in mm -hmm. uh, Waina, and, and he um, they have a policy at their clinic of not putting up any political or religious symbols. So when um, some of the staff or, or somebody had put up an American flag, he said you know you have to take this down. Mm -hmm. It's the policy. He got a he got mm -hmm. barraged with um, letters and complaints. You know, calling for his resignation. Mm -hmm. Um, and he took a very principled stand, and, and, and I think it's, it's worked its way out, but it just shows like, you know, how these uh, kind of superficial symbols uh, yeah. get used to. Because, uh, uh, you know, if you want to put the flag, um, you're welcome to put it. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it's your right mm -hmm. uh, to do that, uh, but it's also your right not to do so, uh, because right. there are different ways of expressing patriotism and so forth, and there are different uh, interpretations mm -hmm. of what patriotism is, really. You I, know. I have another story. Sorry for taking up so much time, but... Um, uh, a, a friend of mine has a, a child in elementary school, 
And uh, he, as a Hawaiian, doesn't do the flag pledge. Mm. Uh, but now he was basically coerced into mm -hmm. into doing it, mm -hmm. you know. And he's like, "Wow, Mama, how come I have to do this now? Mm -hmm. You know, what's going on?" Mm -hmm. And so, what is that? You know, uh, it's just creating some really tough uh, uh, tensions and and, and uh, conflicts in the community. And, and um, uh, I think uh, I think some of that you know needs to be. Yeah, the, yeah. The, these okay. these impacts are important. Uh, you know, n not only uh, in the terms we're talking about, but also psychologically and all that kind of stuff, right. and might have long-term impacts yeah. later on. Mimi, did you? Yeah. Uh, well, again, to to put Hawaii and look at the continental U.S. a broader perspective, um, it's it really making confusion of uh, a lot of racial and, and racializations um, on the continental U.S. For example, um, I had read in a newspaper article that blacks and Latinos uh, suddenly have found that they're not the ones being profiled and they're very happy to mm -hmm. themselves, unfortunately, some of them dump on the others mm -hmm. who, who look uh, like Arabs or South Asian or whatever the, the current other is supposed to look like and have even welcomed the police mm -hmm. in, the, in their yeah, right. neighborhoods. Um, you know, that's one uh, kind of almost like a, an ability to divide and rule, to, mm -hmm. to foster that. Mm -hmm. so, so you play one racial group against another. A second way uh, in which um, there's a, been a new division along racial lines mm -hmm is unfortunately, again, I, I don't generalize for everybody, but some South Asians, mm -hmm. some Sikh groups who wear the turban mm -hmm. and have been mistakenly targeted, yeah. uh, sometimes at the loss of, of life, uh, for being um, Arab or Middle Eastern, instead of kind of forging, you know, we are all brothers, including our Muslim brothers, our Arab brothers, our Hindu and, you know, Sikh brothers, there's been uh, groups that have held signs, we are not Muslims, yeah. we are six. Yeah. And now I even read in one of the uh, continental um, India community papers that at least two Sikh communities have hired public relations mm. firms in New mm. Jersey to better educate the U.S. Uh, public that uh, six are not Muslims mm. and six come from India and they don't come from Saudi yeah, Arabia. That's, that's really so, interesting. You yeah. know, this is not mm. to say that there's anything wrong with attempting to educate, but it has to again be seen that it's not, it's okay to spit on the Muslim, just yeah. don't mistake yeah. us for Muslim. And it, right. That's yeah, and not that's, a good uh, That's psychology. really against the uh, spirit uh, and the intent of the Constitution, actually, because the Constitution talks about uh, protecting the rights of minorities, you know. And uh, that's one of the main tenets of the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. Constitution. And this is just going by the wayside once we are in crisis. And you, you would know uh, the importance of uh, something, you know, when it, uh, it is facing a crisis mm -hmm. to see whether it's really real or not. And that right. is a tragedy. Uh, I think, and that's, uh, I mean, patriotism to me means protecting mm -hmm. the Constitution of the United States, especially the Bill of Rights and especially the right. First right. Amendment. Right. I mean, that is the patriotism, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that goes beyond flags. Whether you put it on a flag on your car or house or whatever, uh, you know, the main thing is uh, do you or do you not protect and defend the Constitution of the United States? That is the real measure of patriotism, the, the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, but I think, you know, another thing that's important is the question of, uh, and you mentioned it, uh, Carl, about uh, Native Hawaiians, you know, and the struggle for Native Hawaiian rights, et cetera. And uh, it, has, it has changed, and I agree with you on that. It has changed since, uh, you know, September 11th. But uh, the thing is that uh, which way it has changed is very important to take note of, it seems to me. Any... Uh, comments on that or any ideas about how it uh, might have changed beyond what Kyle uh, mentioned uh, regarding for instance uh, you know the uh, question of the Akaka bill as an example uh, would the Akaka bill pass at this juncture you know this time around it failed last time in the house it passed the Senate but uh, would it pass any ideas on this or would it not pass since you know uh, there might be like a, some kind of backlash against minorities as such as uh, you know and this I think is very important mm -hmm. at this point any ideas on 
I think it's something that was sort of put on the uh, congressional back burner because okay. of this uh, um, more greater urgency to pass these bills now having to do with uh, the terrorism, terrorism, the, terrorism Act, yeah. the Patriot Act. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so even, it may not yeah. come out of uh, this session right. at all. So even the Hawaiians, uh, Native Hawaiians who uh, want to be quote unquote realistic and uh, you know go along with uh, the mainstream, uh, uh, you know, are, not, are finding that uh, there's no <laughs> there's no recourse for them either. You know, and this is the majority of Hawaiians, Native Hawaiians, mm -hmm. who are active mm -hmm. in the movement and so on. So I think that's uh, a major uh, problem here. And this is one of the main impacts on Hawaii, it seems to me. And if there's a relationship, uh, I mean, you know, if there's an impact on the Native Hawaiian movement with that, that would affect uh, the rest of uh, the ethnic groups in Hawaii, because then what is the relationship vis-a-vis -vis the Native Hawaiian, et cetera, on the question of the Akaka Bill and other things. Uh, I think now it's uh, <clears throat> time to shift, uh, since even also John talked about the impact, uh, economic impact on uh, minorities like Filipinos and Samoans, et cetera, but to shift to the um, economic impact mm -hmm. on Hawaii, yeah. I think it's a uh, good time. But I just want to remind uh, viewers that uh, we uh, live on the air and uh, we'd like to um, uh, hear from you and on Oahu 9565670 on the neighbor islands 1-800-342-7949. Uh, so we have a tape actually um, of uh, interview uh, that uh, we did at the state capitol uh, on the first uh, day of the news uh, of the special session. Okay, so if the tape is ready, we go. I think the significance of the rally and what's happening uh, in terms of worker relief in Hawaii parallels an effort on the national at the national level, um, and it, it, what has happened at the national level up to this point is is frankly shameful. Uh, they the airline industry came in and requested a bailout, a 15 billion dollar bailout, which passed. Uh, Hawaii congressional delegation and 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 uh, other friends tried very hard to get included in that bailout relief for workers, for relief for airline workers. That unfortunately was blocked. So the effort then focused on the airline, uh, airport and airline security bill, which uh, dealt with security within the airlines. Uh, in the Senate, our senators as well as um, uh, all the Democrats and five Republicans and one independent pushed very hard to get uh, a Carnahan Amendment, which, which provided worker relief for airline workers. Uh, uh, amended the airline security bill with the Carnahan Amendment. Unfortunately, 44 Republican senators uh, threatened the filibuster and was able to then force uh, 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 the majority to, to withdraw that amendment. And the Airline Security Act came out of the Senate without any kind of worker relief. Um, the focus now is on the, uh, the economic stimulus bill. Uh, the estimates are about $100 billion. Uh, the, uh, the National FLCIO President Sweeney has come out very strongly asking Congress to reject what he calls tax profiteering. Uh, there is very little in there on worker relief. And so at this point in time, given the billions of dollars that have been given out to corporations, at this point there isn't a cent that has actually come down and been passed for workers uh, and, and working families. Uh, no, no federal extension of unemployment insurance, uh, and no uh, federal extension of COBRA uh, support. Uh, no uh, retraining, job placement provisions, and, and those are the key demands right now. Okay, so this gives us uh, the um, question of, uh, you know, what's happening nationally. And Clyde Hayashi uh, is the person from the labor uh, perspective to talk about those kinds of things. But all these uh, national uh, bills uh, that, uh, you know, are passing now, uh, have a lot of impact um, on Hawaii and Hawaii's workers. I mean, we are all Americans, yes, but uh, still uh, there are uh, kind of uh, consequences uh, for like working class Americans uh, uh, different from the corporations. I mean, he talked about uh, the uh, bailout for the airlines. I mean, $15 billion. I mean, that's uh, nothing to sneeze at, especially mm -hmm. in these uh, terrible financial times. Yeah. So, um, any uh, comments on on that? 
John? Well, you elect a Republican president, that's what you're going to get. You know, it benefits for the corporations rather than workers. It's not surprising that it w turns out that way, but it just shows you within uh, less than a year, this is how the uh, uh, administration is turned around. Yeah. But I'm not sure if maybe Clinton might have not, might not have done anything much different either. Y yeah, that's the thing. Uh, do you have uh, Well, it's just, uh, you know, the, this war just creates the cover to, you know, raid the, <laughs> raid the cookie jar, you know, <laughs> for all the things that they couldn't do uh, in, a, in any normal s circumstances. You know, this emergency situation yeah. just, um, uh, just pushing through some really horrible legislation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mimi, uh, you have yeah, well, just to take a reverse and uh, look at things much more from uh, the viewpoint of the islands mm -hmm. here, um, we call it 911, and I was joking uh, before we started that 911 is also a call for help. Yeah. Uh, so islands in crisis, we need help, and maybe 911 is a wake-up call specifically regarding our economy and our um, really one-sided uh, monoculture which relies on tourism mm -hmm. because tourism is we all know the most vulnerable industry and especially uh, where you have to get to the tourist destination by airplanes you can't just drive there um, I'm wondering now what will be the impact of this uh, which is even further decimating our tourist economy mm -hmm. whether this is really going to be a wake-up call for our legislators and policy makers and others um, to, to rethink what our political economy should be like. Because uh, if nothing else, it has shown us that tourism is terrible. And uh, the plane that crashed yesterday on its way to the Dominican Republic, I heard that's also another island that relies heavily on tourism. And they're going down the tubes uh, even more now. Uh, because people are going to be afraid to fly yeah, there. Yeah, right. So, uh, what what will will we be have to go under before uh, politicians and policymakers wake up, or can we, the people, um, you know, do something now? I yeah, that's that's really critical because look uh, at uh, Aloha Airlines; uh, mm -hmm. they uh, cut their operations by twenty percent, and then. Uh, they going into uh, bankruptcy, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Aloha. Uh, Hawaiian cut 20% of their operations, but they haven't gone into bankruptcy yet. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's really serious. I mean, people are losing their jobs. And uh, so uh, clearly we have to rethink, uh, uh, you know, what is it beyond tourism right. that we well, can do? And what kind of tourism or whatever else? Right, because it's not only jobs in the airline industry, yeah. but it's poss possibly more jobs that, um, you know, John was talking about, the people who, uh, woman and man, the basic service industry yeah. in tourism. Mm -hmm. If we have no tourists, mm -hmm they're going to lose their jobs. And it mm -hmm. seems that tourism is not going to rebound for quite some time yeah. for a number of uh, reasons of which, um, you know, fear of flying is, is just one. Yeah. And the other thing, the economy wasn't, wasn't doing good before September 11th. And uh, a lot of mm -hmm. the airlines were going down the tube anyway without uh, this September 11th thing. So that was just like an excuse, it seems to me, for a bailout. Mm -hmm. I can understand why the government wants to do this because they say, and it's true, it's a critical linchpin, mm -hmm. the airlines, because then if nobody flies, then you're not going to go to hotels and this and that and the other. This is true. But I mean, it's uh, unconscionable to have like $15 billion, you know, of aid, including guarantee, uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, guarantees, financial guarantees. And one other interesting thing, um, I can't remember where, I think it's locally, uh, they're asking people to, uh, certain jobs to voluntarily take a cut in pay. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. Lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how many of our CEOs <laughs> are going to voluntarily take a cut in their pay and perhaps uh, roll back their profits. Oh. Well, well, I don't know what profits they'll be having, but however, profit is, is again, like statistics. You can yeah. lie and right. suddenly you lose profits when, when you really have a lot in the bank. But how, how much they're, they're willing to share, basically. Yeah. Uh, in fact, on that one, uh, it's interesting what's going on, on the, in Congress now that they, uh, the Congress and the President wants to give uh, all corporations 
uh, the taxes that I have paid since 1986. I mean, that is already spent. It's unconscionable that anybody would talk about this kind of stuff, all in the name of, uh, you know, pumping up, uh, pumping you know, kick-starting uh, the, mm -hmm. the economy and all that kind of stuff. But there are other ways of doing this mm -hmm. without giving them uh, the taxes that they have already paid, which were minuscule anyway compared to what they used to pay before. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is really unconscionable, it seems to me. Again, the question of, well, if we're all in it together, why don't you guys mm -hmm. sacrifice as mm -hmm. well? You mm -hmm. know, why it's only the worker? Why it's only the, the worker in the hotel who uh, is doing the beds and, you know, doing this and that and the other kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, important service here? So that's a uh, very important thing. Uh, yes, John. You well, I want to go back what, to what Mimi said about um, our over-dependence on tourism uh, because we had recessions in the early 80s, we had recessions in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. But you always get this knee-jerk reaction from the uh, politicians. Uh, first thing Cayetano does, he goes to Japan. Then he goes to New York. Mm -hmm. It's always to lure more tourists to Hawaii. These guys should have figured a long time ago, this does not happen by accident. Right. Our dependence on tourism has put us in this position where we know that they're going to be, without uh, attacks on the World Trade Center, they're going to be fluctuations in the economy that's going to result in downturns. They should have started talking about diversifying the economy a long time ago. Mm. Uh, there's a speech uh, on campus today by Guy Kawasaki. You know, the, um, grew up in Kalihi Valley, so he used to be, work for Apple Corporation. Uh, he's a uh, leading high-tech uh, uh, spokesperson in Silicon Valley. He says, the way to develop a high-tech industry is start with a, a first-class university. Yeah, and that's something that's that right. That and that's what's going on invested. right now, first-class university, <laughs> right. right? I mean, budget <laughs> right. cuts and all also, that kind of stuff. Also, I hope nobody uh, accuses you of being unpatriotic, after all, to uh, criticize tourism. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, you know, <laughs> if that's you don't right. like it, maybe you should leave. <laughs> <laughs> no, but actually, yeah, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to add, the, um, and this is the month that uh, welfare cuts, the five-year limits mm -hmm. are coming up for that first group. And yeah. so, you know, people are going to be forced out there yeah. looking for work, and there are none. Yeah, so that is a big impact on Hawaii. Oh, what yeah. are they going to do? I mean, you know, I mean, are we all in it together? If we are, if that's the case, then let's prove it, uh, folks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Caetano on down. Um, we have uh, a segment uh, also at the labor rally at uh, the first day of the legislature, a special session opened, and I was interviewing Eric Gill from Local 5. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we will have also uh, another segment uh, along with it uh, of Maisie Hirono saying what she is doing or what the state is doing. Okay. Rally. We weren't sure if uh, anything would have been accomplished by now, but we wanted to make sure that we had people down so that uh, so the people here would, uh, would hear us a little more clearly. Uh, what we were concerned about in, in terms of our union was to take care of those uh, employees who were impacted and, and who lost hours or lost, lost their jobs entirely as a result of the downturn in the industry after September 11. And of course, in some, uh, some of the areas, we also have an additional impact from dengue fever. So we've got a, we've got a double whack out there. And uh, some of our members would not have been able to maintain their medical coverage because of the reduction in hours. So what we're looking for here is for the government to help subsidize that payment, uh, that COBRA payment, self-pay self payment into the, um, into the medical funds so that we can retain our current medical uh, benefits. That's what we were interested in. Uh, in addition, there are several other bills. Of course, the extension of unemployment, uh, that was not controversial, so we expected that to fly through, and we do. Uh, and there's also some bills relating to fixing up the schools and uh, various things for the university. Uh, so we're trying to make sure that, uh, that a good package goes through the special session. Lieutenant Governor Maisie Hirono went on national television today to make a pitch for Hawaii. She told CSNBC uh, now that the uh, terrorist attacks have impacted our state and what Hawaii is doing to bring tourism back. There are some very uh, attractive packages to come to Hawaii from the West Coast. I know that there's one tour, very large tour agency, that is offering trips to Hawaii seven days for only about $350. That includes airfare. 
Well, I mean, is this going to solve the problem? I mean, especially after the uh, tragic incident of, uh, you know, the American airliner uh, yesterday. yesterday. I mean, this is uh, really something. But before we comment on this, I have um, uh, two questions. Uh, maybe we take one uh, on, on the economy by Roy. Uh, he wants, uh, he says, talk more about John's Act in terms of commerce and navigation in Hawaii. Anyone uh, is... Uh, familiar with John's Act in terms of commerce and navi uh, navigation. Um, I personally don't know anything about <laughs> John's Act myself, uh, oh, but in terms Jones, of... Jones uh, Act? Uh, probably Jones Act, not <coughs> John's Act. So somebody wrote the Jones Act, yeah. D do you know anything about uh, commerce and navigation um, on that one? No, with the I'm Act? Very, uh, I, I, think it w I think what it does is, is uh, it forces all foreign commerce to go through a west coast port or only one port yeah. of entry and so you know we get By extra, yeah we get, it, we get things shipped back from the west coast yeah here. so that would so create more uh, yeah right? more expensive stuff um, yeah and does it also uh, say uh, something about uh, american carriers um, you know, I'm not, yeah. I'm not okay. But uh, basically, it uh, it increases the uh, cost because of one port of entry, West Coast. Right. Is that? And, and I think here? you know some some sovereignty advocates, and and I think in Puerto Rico they're also saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. the independence advocates is that it would be cheaper to get to be trading with other countries mm -hmm. if uh, Hawaii was a okay. you know had its yeah. own ports. Yeah, so uh, sorry we don't know much about <laughs> this particular one, uh, but uh, we tried to uh, uh, answer it to the, uh, as best we can. Uh, there's another uh, question um, uh, from John. Uh, do you see a police state coming into place like what happened in World War II? Uh, that is government stepping in uh, and taking control. So um, anyone? on that before we go back to the uh, question of uh, the economy. And this has to do also the economy because if people begin to like uh, figure out, hey, we want to demand certain things and so on, uh, they might be uh, hit by uh, being unpatriotic and all that kind of stuff, which reminds me like in World War II there was this uh, uh, martial law, right? Mm -hmm. And nobody can uh, mm -hmm. leave their job because, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it is important for the economy. So, I mean, is that possible here too? I don't know. So anyone, maybe? No, I, I, I don't know. Maybe in some places we already have a police state. Maybe certain uh, communities experience mm -hmm. it as a police state. Um, but surely with the passing of the Patriot Act and, and all these other um, laws and procedures and policies that are going to infringe on civil liberties, um, I think many people are afraid that it's really going to erode uh, what rights we have and uh, at what point erosion of rights becomes a police state or how you define yeah. it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a thin line and um, I, I just think uh, this is what we, we are seeing and going to see. Yeah, because uh, uh, Kyle, do you have uh, something? Well, I guess um, I would just add it seems that maybe they wouldn't, uh, it, it wouldn't be politic to do the kind of uh, martial law that we had during mm -hmm. World War II, mm -hmm. but I ar already there are elements of this kind of covert, mm -hmm. you know, surveillance, um, sort of harassment of, of uh, dissenting uh, opinions, yeah. you know, and, uh, and, and I, I think that maybe we'll see that sort of thing increase. Yeah, it's interesting uh, to me uh, because, uh, you know, the question of, uh, like, trying uh, to, um, uh, you know, listen in on the conversation through uh, Verizon, you know, whatever, on your conversation, et cetera, um, I, I'm pretty sure this was happening before, <laughs> even without a warrant or without anything, you know. Um, but uh, the, the fact of the matter now, it is legal to do it without a warrant. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the thing is that uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the uh, bill that uh, were pass passed uh, in Congress, uh, anti-terrorism bill, etc., uh, uh, Ashcroft uh, or you know uh, people why in, uh, in the administration wanted to pass it last year before the September 11th mm -hmm. but now with the September yeah. 11th mm -hmm. there was That's all right. the more reason to do so mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, why don't we do this? Uh, we have another segment uh, from uh, the same rally, and this is uh, Mori Yoshihara, who represented the University of Hawaii Professional Assembly. Uh, we, uh, I interviewed her, and we talked uh, about uh, you know the same kind of uh, stuff. So, if the tape ready, let's roll. Yeah. There are two main reasons. One is that UPA, we wanted to show to the community that UPA as an organization in this community are very dedicated to, we, we care and we're dedicated to the community and we're doing everything we can to support uh, the people in need, people who lost jobs, for example. And UPA actually is making uh, pretty big, major and concrete plans to show our, con show our dedication to the community by making um, significant contributions um, in terms of money and also we're going to um, launch this uh, fundraising campaign which will be announced more officially um, in, uh, very shortly. The university is directly affected by this, and we have a very kind of direct, close-knit relationship with what's happening both globally and locally. Um, 13,000 family uh, people have already lost jobs in Hawaii since September 11th. A great many of those uh, people who lost their jobs are either UH students or parents of UH students, which means that many people are having to drop out of university or schools. Um, and thousands of high school students who are going to school now, um, they're going to be their access to college education is or will be endangered by this economic crisis. Um, furthermore, we are facing um, likely uh, major budget cuts at the university, which will also um, impose great difficulties in providing quality education to our students. So we are, in that sense, we are. Um, we are part of the crisis, and if, if the community is going to heal and recover from this crisis, we have to take care of the working families in Hawaii and invest in our future. Like, for example, um, unemployment benefits, I think it's going to pass, and um, medical coverage for the unemployed, that's going to pass, and all that is good because that helps um, the working families and people who, who are, who lost their jobs, and that's, that's uh, crucial to the rebuilding of the, uh, rebuilding of the community. Um, in terms of um, uh, capital gains um, tax cuts for the businesses. Of course, it's it's very important to rebuild businesses because downturn of the economy, businesses going bankrupt, that will directly affect the, the employees. But um, more importantly, we need to make sure that we take care of the um, the families in need. I mean, people. Generally speaking, like tax cuts for businesses tend to benefit the people who are not in as much need as the people who are unemployed. So I think we want to be careful about that. Yeah, well, we still have like a few more minutes left, so uh, we can like talk about the Eric tape and uh, you know Mari's uh, interview as well. Uh, any um, opinions on that? Uh, in fact, actually, the, there's more than thirteen thousand who have been uh, you know. Uh, unemployed now. There's uh, close to 20,000, I hear, this number. Uh, so, I mean, it's really uh, tragic uh, to hear of all those kinds of things. So, I wonder if, uh, for instance, the um, legislature in its special session did anything to alleviate the problems uh, of the poor as opposed to the problems of the rich? Um, any was, was there any direct aid to the poor in that package? I, I, I um, I'm not uh, of unemployment benefits. Uh, well, that's the for, yeah, one. that's that's uh, the uh, one of the few things. But mm. uh, mostly, it's like you know, uh, construction money and all that kind of stuff. Although they didn't give Caetano everything yeah. uh, he wanted, but he got uh, practically six fifty million dollars, which is quite a bit of uh, money, uh, including w uh, what kind of <coughs> projects he has uh, already online now, even before the legislative session. Yeah. Well, well, let me raise this question then, because you. You're, you're the economist there. You know, if, if we uh, pump $1 billion in construction money into the economy, how does that benefit the people who got laid off in Waikiki? Yeah, well, that's, that's, uh, that's it. I mean, uh, so it's, it's not really carpenters? targeted. <laughs> yeah, it's not really targeted. So actually, uh, we have like just uh, a few, um, several seconds left, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, our viewers, and I would like to thank you for coming and sharing uh, your views with us. And I hope uh, you know uh, we have um, been of good service to the community with regard to the question of islands in crisis. And I hope that somebody will hear our clarion call at 911. And we have to all put our heads together to figure out what needs to be done. And most of all, we need to 
protect civil liberties in Hawaii and protect the Constitution. And that is, I think, the most important thing because without that, nobody would be able to talk uh, about what needs to be done, be, uh, be done uh, for Hawaii to get it out of this crisis. Thank you very much.